you are a helicopter. And so the paradigm, a lot of this is a, it's a mental mind frame, like the way you attack a problem or address a problem, right? Um, we, I believe, are increasingly in believing that success is an airplane. You want to be strong and powerful. You want to fly 500 people. You want to just go fast. I think after all of these years, I'm encouraging people to be a helicopter. You have vertical lift. You can land. You can land anywhere. You can move in six different directions. Um, you can't carry a lot of people. So it's a really good symbol of agency. And you have to teach people to fly. And you also want to have more agency over your life. You don't really want to be a passenger in someone else's airplane. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Belmont Books. Tonight, we are delighted to host award-winning business leader, impact investor, investor and educator, James Reed, in partnership with the GBH Forum Network for the launch of his new book, Red Helicopter, A Parable for Our Times. Today is the publication date, and we are thrilled to be here with James for that. Joining James in conversation is Cliff Hakim. Cliff has worn many different shoes. As a teacher, writer, author, career counselor, executive search co consultant and coach, and an art artisan entrepreneur. We're all in for a treat tonight as we share the insights and knowledge that James has accumulated over decades of investing and leading at the highest levels of business. Here's, here are a few quotes on the Red Helicopter on its early reviews. Imagine if your habits were infused with meaning. This parable for our times will inspire you to transform yourself and your teens as they lead with integrity, agility, and courage. That's from Charles Duhigg, New York Times bestselling author of Super Communicators. Red Helicopter is a breath of fresh air in a cluttered, cluttered world of self-improvement and business literature. For anyone looking to find purpose in the chaos and to embrace life's deeper connections, Red Helicopter is a guiding light. I enthusiastically endorse this book for anyone eager to elevate their life and career with heartfelt authenticity and clear-eyed vision. That's from Dr. Marshall Goldsmith, author of The Earned Life. James Ree is an acclaimed impact investor, founder, CEO, goodwill strategist, thought leader, and educator who empowers people, brands, and organizations by marrying capital with purpose. He bridges the emotional with the mathematical and gives permission for us to be human. A longtime private equity investor, James also serves as a founding member of the J.P. Morgan Chase's Advancing Black Pathways, a charter member of Ashoka's An Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur Network, and former chair of the Innovation Committee of the National Retail Federation. In addition to his private sector endeavors, Reed teaches at Howard University, where he serves as the Johnson Chair of Entrepreneurship, the MIT Sloan School of Management, and Duke School of Law. He lives locally here in the Boston area. Cliff Hakim is the author of the book and pioneer of the concept by the same name, We Are All Self-Employed. Cliff has guided executives, managers, specialists, and entrepreneurs on this concept through transitions, to know themselves better, to explore their options, and to honor their passion by reaching new meaningful goals. As founder of an artisan business called Inspired Stones, he has been commissioned to create memorial benches that tell a loved one's story using natural stone and reclaimed iron. In the past few years, he has been experimenting with pen, brush, and ink. Cliff began painting shoes in 2018, and their soulful message inspired him to write and illustrate Walk in My Shoes, the path to empathy and compassion. How we learn to be kinder by walking in the shoes of others and becoming more aware of how we walk in our own shoes. Please join me in welcoming James and Cliff. Hi. Hello. 
Yeah, so um, this will become clearer maybe. It may not after an hour. But the book is actually composed as a piece of music. It's in three acts. There's a bridge, a coda, a um, prelude. Um, it literally is in E-flat major. So um, one of the key parts in we're going to talk about is the concept of and and duality. And um, in music, it's called counterpoint, where you have two melodies, and you're not asking anyone to play harmony. You literally are playing two melodies, and there's an emergent melody that stems from the two melodies. It's not easy, and what happens is that the third melody makes the other melodies better. And it's a metaphor. And so um, we're going to get into the storyline, but the first song you're going to hear, it, it literally is what it means to be Korean. It's called Adirang. It's a 600-year-old UNESCO-protected piece, North and South Korea. It, if you're Korean, it, it's just, it is Korea. It just is what it is. And the other piece is Amazing Grace. Um, and I think you're going to hear it, it in counterpoint. This is a two-minute fractal of the entire book in this original arrangement. So maybe we could just start with this, and then it'll set the mood for the conversation. After you read the book, I don't want to spoil too much of it, but there's a bit of sweetness to the book. And for those who know our personal friends, you probably can hear my father and my mother dying um, during the book, and a bunch of friends who came to support, to support me during that. So Let's kind of anchor ourselves and talk about the Red Helicopter story. So the Red Helicopter and childhood, your thoughts? So it's meant to be a metaphor, so there's a reason why there's no actual red helicopter on the cover, because mm -hmm. I'm encouraging everyone to have their own. It's not meant to be prescriptive. It's not a prescriptive book. Uh, it's maybe it's more, it's just giving permission. So for me, it was a literal <laughs> red helicopter. Uh, I was, you know, a little kid, bang cut, five-year-old, 1976 public school, Long Island kindergarten. And uh, I came home from school one day with a toy red helicopter. It sort of looked like this. It's, this is a replica. Like three dollars. Remember the packaging and the five and dime, and you rip it open. And, and then it's a story of a lot of things where you think you're wrong. And so, you know, maybe the first thing my parents were thought I had taken it from school. And I said, no. 
And you have to think about 1970s parenting, particularly 1970s Korean parenting. It, there's something in Korean you say, "irenaso," like yegi he, which means stand up. You're slowly standing up in front of your parent like this. <laughs> OK? <laughs> like ball cut. Um, and then they thought they had done something wrong because I said I was the only one who got it because they had thought they had gotten American customs wrong, that I was supposed to come with a gift. And they were like, they really were focused on me assimilating. And then they got annoyed with me, particularly my dad, because <laughs> I didn't know why I got it. And he's like, what do you mean you don't know why you got it? And I was like, I don't know. And it's like, you get the ch flushed cheeks. And anyway, they found out later, uh, and they brought me into the family room. They made me stand up again. And they, he asked me, he's like, why are you sharing half of this lunch that mom makes every morning for you? very Korean mother, like, love is food. Why are you giving half your lunch away? And I just remember looking at him, and I thought I was in trouble <laughs> for um, sharing. And because it was not easy for the Rees in the mid-70s. They were in this country for less than 10 years at that point. And so, you know, today we call scarcity mindset, abundance mindset. I didn't know those terms back in 1976, but I had an abundant mindset. I said, why wouldn't I give my friend food? He doesn't have any. And I thought I was going to get in a lot of trouble, and I sort of said it defiantly, actually. And um, my dad got very emotional. And men, you know, I think sometimes we're not very good with we could be better, and particularly my dad and I didn't speak emotionally very well together. He got very emotional. And he's like, you think I'm mad at you? I'm really proud of you. And so that story stuck with me. Um, it just it represents a lot of things. My parents' hardship, difficulty of communicating, childlike wisdom, intuition. And then as I got older and older and you start putting armor on, you get the degrees and the credentials, you start mistaking wisdom for like education. I think wisdom gets diluted versus knowledge. So it's a symbol of all of those things, about encouraging people to trust their intuition about what is decent, what is right. And it's all that. Uh, do you think we all have a childhood story like that that we can go back to and w tells us as much as it tells you? Well, I think it's more of an open. I, I would never presume that everyone has a story like that, but maybe there is a story that reminds you of Maybe it's hardship, um, something with your parents, the person that you wish to be more often, that you wish you could be more like that, but then you look around and you know, I wrote about playing a game of Monopoly that sometimes you're going around and around this board. You wish there were more free parking spots <laughs> and community chest and chance, but instead there's just a lot of you know, luxury tax, and <laughs> it's that game, and that it's, it's a lot of this is about, I think we all have who we want to be, or who we see ourselves, and we don't allow a lot of people to see it. Um, I just, I'm encouraging people to, by reading this book, to be that. I think in my life, I've tried to, I think increasingly as I've gotten older, a much better job, I think having children particularly too, but um, I've always wanted people to be honest, <laughs> like it's truth, and that's really now I understand Billy Joel's plaintive like honesty. You just want the truth, and so this book is really an exploration of truth. And I, I think I found it in a very place I didn't think I would find it. So, a little ways into the book, you say I experience more clarity than I had in years, and then you go on to say high school teacher and financier, Korean and American. Your thoughts? Uh, it's that song. It's and. You know, I am Korean and American. I have Korean genetics. Um, I am American. I'm a big Bruce Springsteen fan. You know, my wife is a white woman from North Carolina and with a southern accent. I, I just have lived this life of just benign obliviousness, like I don't, 
don't care a lot, a lot of things um, that I guess sometimes I'm supposed to, and that's been a struggle for me. Like I tried to not care, and there were times in my life where I did care. So yeah, that moment that you're speaking about was I was 40, 42. Um, you know, I had this, re like I had lived the life my parents, they wanted, I did the things. Right? I went to that school, this school, got the degree, did that, private equity, doing this. Um, but I was a former high school teacher. I made $12,600 my first job. I, I've just never been driven by money. But I know how to make it. But what's the point of making it if you're hurting people? Like, I just didn't un understand that. So I found it. I left. I left the world that my parents wanted me to create for myself, which they helped create, I literally left. I mean, I was in Secaucus, New Jersey, alone, no friends. I was never been CEO of a retail company. I wasn't black. I wasn't female. I didn't know what peplum was. <laughs> I didn't know anything. And so it was actually very liberating and to just show up and just be me again. And it's more, I was a really fun kid in high school and like, I just didn't care about a lot of things, actually, and so. So, so, um, so we understand in your 40s, the red helicopter appeared, and you yeah. were both in rules and in free will, in a sense. So the and was operating. So yeah. can you say something a little bit more about? Well, it's, if you think about the meaning of this story, I think I wrote in the prelude, I suppressed this part of me for a good chunk of my 20s and late 20s, 30s. I mean, I was in, I mean, Christina, you know. I mean, this was like private equity, Harvard. <laughs> like, just, it's like the pinnacle of credentialing, right? Just, and I don't know. I took a personality test during that time, and they're like, oh, you're the same person at work at home. <laughs> like, it's the same. And I was like, isn't everyone else's? They're like, no, that's not, no, that's not how it works. I'm like, oh, well, that kind of stinks. So, um, yeah, it was, I suppressed a chunk of me that um, it wasn't, like, you don't talk about kindness in private equity. You don't talk about your, you know, immigrant parents who mistakenly bought a menorah because they thought it was beautiful. I didn't know. You don't talk about these things, and those are not success attributes, right? So what do they want? They want like, okay, like, yeah, I'm pretty good with numbers, I'm, and I don't suffer fools lightly. <laughs> like, I can go at them with the best, like, but that's not who I am. Like, it's, I taught high school. It's just who I am. Like, I'm that kid. Like, and that's not a success attribute in certain parts of our success equation. And by being there, the reason why I was reminded of the red helicopter story was not because of what I was doing. It was the way these women received me. You have to picture me just walking into stores in Southside Chicago, Philadelphia, black neighborhoods, and me coming in and saying, I've got nothing, like I'm James. And I said, I'm maybe the least qualified person to run the company, my dad's dying, I'm slightly scared, like I don't know if I can come back from this, like maybe people, I got made fun of during this time period, um, but I was very calm, it felt very liberating, like just to be me and so, they really embraced me. I was very, I'm still very grateful in uh, how they received me. They were, they liked me, actually. And they're like, oh, you can feel your heart, like you care, <laughs> like you're very earnest. I'm like, yeah. But that's not a rewarded characteristic in a lot of my other life, to be earnest, to care. And I didn't want to not care anymore. And so that's why I started thinking about this red helicopter. I was like, that feeling. You know that, I write about it's the warm ache in your chest. You know that feeling? <laughs> like, there's no AI that will ever replicate that feeling. 
it's, it's just humanity. And I felt it. And I felt it that day in the family room in 1976. I felt it when I asked Meg to marry me. And I felt it when my kids came, you know? Like, I, so, like, I want to have that feeling. So that's why this all was coming at me and, you know, and my dad was dying. And so I was thinking about a lot of these things, about the type of life I so, wanted to have. So, so your honesty at Ashley was almost unconventional as you're talking about it, but it sounds so natural to you. And so your honesty opened what door at Ashley? You know, there's, uh, yeah, uh, there's a Korean expression, uh, it's called chang, which my TED talk is about goodwill. Chang is deeper than that. There's not an English word for chang. Goodwill is the best way I would describe it is the end of It's a Wonderful Life. That's why you cry, because you're watching this man suffer for like two hours, and then his wife has, is the one who makes it tangible to him. But she makes the intangible tangible, and he sees it, and he's been doing it fastidiously, in a commercial environment, by the way, right, for years. And, you know, he points it out, and literally, goodwill becomes monetary. I'm pretty sure they didn't. It was a non-recourse loan, right? They didn't make him pay back the money. <laughs> like, pretty sure that was the dot, dot, dot. And so um, Chong is even beyond that. It's a, it's, I think what's happening right now in the world, talking about counterpoint, there's certain words and feelings that are not in English. It, there's a cultural counterpoint. Right, so in a lot of Asian culture, uh, there's less emphasis on form. It's more on motion. It's movement. So we're in a very Aristotelian education system here, so it's, there's a pecking order, form, motion. In Asia, it's not like that, it's motion. So there's a fluidity, it's, more, it's closer to quantum physics, actually. <laughs> like, where it's what's wave, what's particle, what's particle's wave. It's, it's that ability to sort of do that. So It's not only it's that, and it's a movement that you can't see. It's stillness yeah. as well. So the, an airplane flies in two directions, up or down. Your helicopter flies six. in six directions. Yeah. Uh, the um, dragonfly flies in six directions. Uh, the it was six based directions, off a right? helicopter. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So... Um, how does stillness fit into this equation of movement? Because when, like a helicopter, one of the hardest thing to do as a helicopter, the helicopter is a metaphor, obviously, in a lot of different ways. Each of us is a helicopter. That's the, you are a helicopter. And so the paradigm, a lot of this is a, it's a mental mind frame, like the way you attack a problem or address a problem, right? Um, we, I believe, are increasingly uh, in believing that success is an airplane. You want to be strong and powerful. You want to fly 500 people. You want to just go fast. I think after all of these years, I'm encouraging people to be a helicopter. You have vertical lift. <laughs> you can land. You can land anywhere. You can move in six different directions. Um, you can't carry a lot of people. So it's a really good symbol of agency. And you have to teach people to fly. And you also want to have more agency over your life. You don't really want to be a passenger in someone else's airplane. Like, you have to fly your, fly your flight. So the last thing that people teach a helicopter pilot, the hardest maneuver is hovering. It's the last maneuver. And oftentimes, the language used to describe effective helicopter pilots is the language you also see in Buddhist theology. It's being able to just balance. <laughs> it's constant movement. It's hovering. It's like literally three mechanisms. You're constantly moving. They often describe it as the feeling of balancing a polished marble on a shiny, flat piece of glass. That's hovering in helicopter pilot terms. And 
it's you're not standing still you're moving and so a lot of this book is taking the opposite view and saying are you sure staying still is not <laughs> requiring real discipline and dynamic action it it often is so in your stillness you recognized and other people recognized that the world was noticing ostensibly that you were selling clothing to plus size black women yeah. but you argued with that you weren't selling only clothing in fact the least thing you were selling was clothing so in your stillness what was what what did you tell your cohort that you, you were yeah. selling. I mean, in the song, by the way, it's, you know, did you hear the part where it sounds like an awful lot like Paco Bell and Vivaldi? It's struggle. That's chapter four. It's the first. It's called Agency. I wanted to go home. <laughs> like, the whole world turned its back on us. And I was alone. And I didn't want to stay. And so, um, yeah, I was really lonely, actually. So, um, I thought I'd sort of rip my whole life apart. And my dad was not, ha my parents were not, they didn't understand. Because we had a language barrier too. And so they're like, why is our son, the CEO of a twice bankrupt company selling women's apparel in black neighborhoods with no Wi-Fi? <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's, it's more than that, dad and mom. Like, I, the women remind me of mom. Like, you know, like, that's the person that does everything, right? Twelve hats, raises the kids, works hard all the time, gets no credit, doesn't ask for it, system does not reward, does not reward her. It's, the game is not wired for her to win. So then she blames herself. And then, yeah, it's that dynamic. I grew up with a woman like that. I think... Look what's happening right now. I won't go off, off on a tangent. Look what's happening to, <laughs> like, in this country right now with with women, with rights and generally with women. Um, anyway, so that's that was what I saw. So by being alone, that struggle, I had no outside stimulus. I was literally alone in Sakaka, staring outside, like in my office, in like two in the morning, just like, oh my gosh, and it all just sort of came to me. I'm just like, this is. It was super clear, and um, and I started laughing a lot, even though it sounds sad. Like suffering, there's a lot of laughing. Like I just found my sense. Like I, I'm kind of ridiculous. I don't know. Like I'm oddly amusing. Like I laugh at weird. things. I just started laughing. I'm like, that's. I was crying, laughing, and just that's what it was. And so during that time, I realized, oh, these women are my mom. And that progressively became clearer to me. And then when I went into the stores, I watched all of the women's like the behaviors and the, like physical gestures that are not in spreadsheets. So I write in the book, it reminded me of when my mom, once a year, we would drive into Queens from Long Island. We grew up in like we were the only like not Caucasian family. And the closest minorities we had, we were like really raised by Jews. <laughs> Actually, the, the, um, the, the Jews really took care of us. So they used to debate whether I qualify for minion, but that's an aside. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just, um, I saw the same, my mom would go into a Korean grocery store and I could see her just have swagger once a year, just swagger, like her neck, the way she stood. She's making jokes. <laughs> She's like telling the sales clerk, hey, this kimchi's old, what's this? It's just, I'm like, wow, mom's got swag, right? Mom's a bit of a diva in <laughs> this Korean grocery store. You can see it right here. And I saw it. And the same thing, the women at this place, this, they'd walk in and then you can just see it. Like shoulders go back. Just the laugh came back, and it's beautiful. Like it's really a nice thing to be able to see for someone to have like that. And so that's the clarity that I had. I was like, this is the same type of space. I, I think that part of your clarity uh, produced an environment that 
uh, was kind of like this environment where I think people feel safe here in an unsafe world. So how did you, how did you do that? I mean, I, I really want to focus on this notion of safety and what that births, what that breeds, and how you kind of create in that when there was so much internalized fear. Yeah. Well, I, in retrospect, I think the most important piece of leader, and it was leadership, and I think this is, a lot of this is about questioning paradigms of leadership, right? And saying, you know what real leadership is, you know what kindness is, you know what it is. <laughs> and you know most of the behavior in your work environment is frankly unacceptable actually, right? And, but we teach it that you're supposed to behave this way and those are the results and uh, there are plenty of leadership CEOs that are being debunked right now. Their track record's not so good, actually. So anyway, the most important thing I think that I did was that first day I walked in there and I said to everyone, I'm, this is what I'm not. In fact, on the surface, everything you need me to be, I'm not. <laughs> and then I said, this was not scripted, okay? I said, but I think that if we can be kind, which I remember saying and saying, what in the world are you doing? Like, you have to imagine, like, this, this was not a good situation. Like, shortly after, I had to hire a police officer to protect the employees who were going to get assaulted in the parking lot because the company had just filed for bankruptcy three years ago and the vendors were pissed. And people were screaming at each other. This was the worst, I, I can't describe how bad the situation was. And then you have me, big dimples, going, if we're kind <laughs> and mathematically honest. And math is very different. I, spent a fair bit of time in the book talking about just the concept of math. Math is a science. Math is physics. It's like laws of nature. It's not what humans have imposed upon things. It's here, just like that song. Like, that music is math. I said, can we just start at the most transcendent place? Can we just meet there? So in a lot of ways, it's like Leonard Bernstein, you know that when Tony sings with Maria somewhere? Can we just meet at that space? Well, what, one of the spaces we can meet is at the lemonade stand. Yes. Right. Well, I mean, that's, so I, a lot of these things, like for those of you who don't have a lot of exposure to accounting, finance, private equity, you may get a, you're going to get a little bit of a JD MBA cog side degree, but you won't know that you're getting it because I teach accounting and finance through a lemonade stand. I do this at MIT, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, if you don't understand the rules of a lemonade stand, then how can you run a $5 billion company? Make kindness tangible through the lemonade stand yeah. and make math tangible through the lemonade stand. Yeah, so, yeah, so here's, a, it's a, it's chapter five. It's actually, a, it's purposely situated in the middle of the book and the chapter is called balance. I thought that was really cool. When I was writing it, I was like, it's pretty cool, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. I was like, in fact, we'll go through the chapters. There's a lot of, everything is pretty intentional about the structure of the book. Um, yeah, so like here's an example with uh, a statement on modern day business and economy right now. So Lemonade Stand, it is a business. Real money. You are paying money for an inferior product. It's terrible, <laughs> right? Grass in the cup, and the kids are like doing this, and you're buying it, and you're giving real cash, and that's the exchange. But clearly, there's more to it than that exchange. There's, you're, there's a positive externality that's being created. You're rewarding past behavior. You're investing in the future of your relationship with your neighbors. You're patting the kid on the head and saying, good for you not playing video games eight hours a day. You're, you're, you are making an investment, and the neighborhood is better for it. it. So that positive externality, that's truly math. Accounting does not pick up. You don't measure it. B 
because it's immeasurable. And so thus in accounting, we say it doesn't have value. And so that's math. And then kindness, when you're creating these things, kindness is the way I view it. I wrote it as an investor. It's an investment that creates a positive externality. And the big eureka in the book for me, which I didn't understand when I was doing this, I believe that the kindest leaders create and invest in someone else's agency. You're allowing people to have agency, Fly, right? Flying lots of helicopters. You're not prescriptive in this way. Is you know? uh, shared problem solving kindness? Yeah, because it's like counterpoint. I mean, so you sing your melody, but you can't sing melodies in a way that destroys the overall composition. There are limits to what you can sing. I mean, that's, that's a song is a beautiful, music and art are structurally honest and consonant structures. There have to be consonant. And so I view business and brands and things as pieces of art. They're, it's con it has to have consonants. And so, yeah, so like collaborative decision making in a business context, it's like, it's unscripted, scripted jazz. Clarinets, oboes, French horn, different timbres, play. But when push comes to shove, there are times when you're going to have to play the notes on the, on the paper. Play them. But uh, the other times, play. <laughs> like riff, scat. Like that's what innovation and creativity are. But people won't do that. I don't know how many of you sing, but have you ever been asked to like scat? Like improvise right now. If people are like, what? And they, f they can't do it. They freeze up. And so I believe that kind environments, it creates these places where people can improvise and be comfortable laughing at themselves, too. So like, a lie did a, it was, I found my humor again in my 40s. I made fun of myself a lot. I still do. And I didn't do that as much in my 30s. So these days I take myself much less seriously. I take other people really seriously. I think in my 30s, I took myself too seriously. Um, so uh, wh wh where does surrender fit in? You I know, think agency, so one of the things that we're all grappling with right now um, is that I, a lot of this is redefining words, like accounting is not accountable, right? So balance. Like balance, balance sheet, balance. Kindness is not niceness. Kindness was actually a fundamental underpinning philosophically of um, liberty and, um, and free markets. Like Rousseau and Adam Smith would write publicly about secular kindness. Kindness is not religious. There's secular kindness. Uh, in economic terms, we talk, call it mutualism, right? Like you're, you need each other. So. Agency, um, I think, to make a small social commentary, we think that agency today means freedom without accountability. I don't think that's agency. I think that's chaos. <laughs> I think that's narcissism. Agency is making informed decisions, informed, right, that you're maximizing or, like, uh, forwarding a cause that's worthy to you. A not, just, not just economic, yeah. <laughs> emotional. Like, it's not, economics only measures utility. We're just not like that. That's not how human beings are. And so agency is that. And then agency also, it's not being um, obsessive with control. Agency requires a degree of knowing that you are not in control of so much of life and that to have agency truly is surrender and in the book my mother who I always thought of as vulnerable in this country you'll read it the real protagonist in these in this book it ain't me mm -hmm. like I'm the bumbling Odysseus <laughs> that's sort of like what it's the women in my life that have it's my mother and it's the predominantly black women who reminded me of my mother. It's my wife, who's in Arizona right now. She's the C of Cure Alzheimer's, so she can't be here right now. And it's, when my mom passed away, she, um, and you know this, the, my, yeah, it's, 
which it's still not easy for me to speak about, but I lost my mom in three weeks. Diagnosis to funeral, pancreatic cancer, just, and she, um, she surrendered. She just said, in Korean it's called kure, like just kure. And I said, what's that mean, mom? She's like, it's okay. It's time. It's good life. And I don't want to go through this. Like, and um, she, I, her friends later told me that part of it was that she knew that if she <laughs> didn't do that, that I'd be sitting next to her bed for the next year. And she didn't want to rip up my family and rip up. So she just surrendered. And she just said, it's been good. And so that's agency, I think. You don't always have to win. Agency doesn't mean winning. It, it's just having a modicum of, um, of humility, actually, that there are things you can control and things you can't. You do the best you can. It's ownership of both. You're accountable. I mean, like, I, like it's kindness, it's agency. You're, it's an accountability. We have, I don't want to go on the soapbox about that, but, like, accountability, it's to others. We are accountable. And, by the way, like, putting my money hat on, when you don't have accountability to others and you have a declination of mutualism, we're going to see how expensive it is to go rogue. Anyone who's looking at the cost of insurance right now, look what's happening. There's real economic consequence to not having mutualism in our society. And so it's not just feel good, there's, it's money too. Am I the only one looking at my insurance bills and saying, oh my gosh? <laughs> Right, auto insurance, and there's some areas in the country you can't get insurance anymore. And so think about the sort of societal implications of what that means. The insurance companies, a lot of them are getting out of insurance, they're going into wealth management. They don't want to be in the business of insuring behavior. And that's a very dangerous place for us to, to be at. I mean, like, all of us have to learn to become the hedgehog you know, with the, the, the uh, kind of brittle, spiny top skin and the... You love, I love that one. Yeah, I love and And the vulnerable underbelly. So is the hedgehog uh, piloting the helicopter? Or yeah, I yeah? think that, uh, the, <laughs> that there's, a, there's a story in here. People, there's, I, in Chapter 6, I start explaining what I believe kindness to be. And I said that I use a lot of my... It's called a parable for a reason. There's a lot of stories, and so for my college friends, it's a little bit like Grandpa Simpson, where there's a long story, and it's like, what's the point? <laughs> and it's like, what do you think, right? Um, so my kids, two of whom, they popped in and popped out, I think. Um, <laughs> they wanted a hedgehog for a pet. And we have a dog that bark barks at everything. I just, so we did our research, and Meg and I were like, no, it's illegal in most states. Hedgehogs <laughs> carry disease. And they're, but when I was looking at the hedgehog, when you turn them upside down, I don't know if you've ever gone on this binge on YouTube, <laughs> they float in water, and they're really soft. So they sit there like a boat, and they're really happy looking. They're like, they look like dogs. And the owners just pet the hedgehog, and the hedgehog just sits there. And I was like, wow. Who knew that the hedgehog had that soft underbelly? So sounding like my dad, who w would talk to me like this, I said to my kids, here's the good and bad news. You're not getting a hedgehog. The good news is daddy has a good lesson. I was like, <laughs> and they're like, the, okay. I was like, you know, I was like, try to live your life like an upside down hedgehog. And, you know, when you walk not upside down and these it gets really heavy on your back, and you can't see things. <laughs> like you start reading into bad, well, like just live upside down. And then one of them always asked me, they, you know, don't people stick things in your <laughs> stomach? And I said, yeah, they do. But you take it out and you hand it right back to them. You look them in the eye and say, did you intend to do that? Even and the insurance companies? Maybe. <laughs> But it's like it's a it's a story just about kindness is not weakness. Kindness is very strong, and kindness doesn't suffer fools. 
doesn't. And kindness doesn't allow people to take away your agency or allow others to take others' people agency. It, it just doesn't. And we need, kindness is courageous because it requires intervention and truth and advocacy for people who relinquish their agency unknowingly. And so that's the metaphor. And so like, I think the other part of kindness, which is why there's, you know, I divide into life, money, joy. Like for me, we expect, I, don't, I, I think I'm not seeing a lot of 15 year olds in this audience. I don't know about you all, but like some of the most important things have agency as an adult. It's some knowledge of how money works right some like the language of accounting it's language it'd be nice if that was taught <laughs> like it'd be nice if we were taught how our brains worked which is the first system we're not so all of these like basic systems of like even like joy and happiness like why we have those emotions like they're generally not taught and so a lot of why I'm spending time in academia right now teaching is I'm trying to invest in people's agency and saying, if you can understand three or four of these systems, then you have more of a fighting shot to have agency. And it's up to you to balance life, money, and joy. That's your formula. I'm not going to be prescriptive. Like, but the only advice I give people is that, and this is all the studies show this too, m try to have your top prop be joy and the rear prop be money. I've met a lot of people who want the top prop to be money. Their helicopters don't fly very well. If that's your truth, is that, is that, fract is that something you can spread? Do you think that that really, joy, money? Life, money, joy. Life, and money, so this, joy? Is it, when, this is for those of you reading the book. I don't, there'll be worksheets in the website. There's also like full music on the website. So if you want to listen to the music, and read the book, you can. It's immersive. Because um, life is immersive. Right? Life is not, a, is not binary. It's a system. So th these are the, actually the chapter names. This is how I teach this in school and at companies. Jeff, where's Jeff? Jeff's CEO of a company. I'm sort of like, what did you call me? Like, am I a sensei? OK. Yeah, it's sort of that. It's like, it's like it's, this is what we're doing for him and also his company. Um, life is present, past, future. It's your red helicopter story, a story that can really evolve but has enough structure. And then the next chapter is act two. It's agency, balance, integration. Like how do you operationalize your life using money without hurting your life? And then joy is the top prop. Um, so once you sort of get this figured out, how do you amplify and how does it work? And so I'm asking for those of you who are visual that it's sort of like you're building the helicopter of you. And then if you're the CEO of a company or running, I'm saying, okay, build the company like this. And this is how I do this in the private sector too. I think about companies as trying to build agile organizations. So I, I can't help but think about the full body, the mind, the heart, the soul. The marathon's coming up on Monday, two weeks ago on the Boston Globe. There was a, um, they, they published the aspirations of some of the marathoners, and one of the marathoners said, when your legs get tired, run with your heart. When your legs get tired, run with your heart. So you were at, with Ashley Stewart for seven years. And... I, you yeah. know, in reading this book, it's just so uh, uh, extraordinary to me that, you know, that how tired your legs got. And so t yeah. talk to us a little bit about the, the run with your heart and your soul. Well, the run ended when my mom died. That was it. <coughs> it's like, <laughs> so was it. And, and the women knew. They said, we died today too, didn't we, James? Um, you should have seen my mom's funeral. Like the women all across the country pooled money to buy flowers. I, I can't even tell you. Like, I mean, you were you were there. I mean, like it just it 
just, they pulled money to buy flowers. The customers pulled money. And so um, that was the end. And then during the, you know, like Meg, my wife, she shouldered too much of some of the house stuff because I was gone too much. And so I write about that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I had a lot of, there was a lot of tragedy during those seven years. Like, you know, it's not just going back and forth from New Jersey to Boston, being alone. You can imagine there were lots of parts of the world that frankly didn't roll out the red carpet for us to be successful. <laughs> we had to fight. Like I fought and they were, I had to fight. Um, I mean, Rob, Rob knows. Rob um, was a friend at Salesforce and um, in the beginning, a lot of the companies, they just, they just couldn't believe it. They're like, what in the world's happening? And then a lot of the leading companies, they, they helped us. It took a little bit, right, three, six months, and then they're like, we want you all to win because they saw themselves in it. They're like, we want, this is good. And so they went out of their way to help us be successful. So. I think that big blow that maybe you're referring to other than the little things like, um, yeah, it was, it's, it's the bridge chapter. Um, chapter seven, um, three, seven, and 10 are important numbers in literature, Bible, like three, seven, 10, 12, 144, right? So in chapter seven, um, it describes a week that my close friends here know what happened. Like, um, my dad died. My daughter almost died. Yeah. And you'll read it. I don't want to spoil it, but it just was a week that I just was sort of looking. I'm a pretty spiritual guy. I'm not necessarily like an active institutional religion guy, but like, I definitely did one of these. I'm like, why? <laughs> like, are you doing? Why are you doing all this? And it was early on in the transformation of the company, so um, I kept it all inside. I didn't tell anyone, and so um, I spent a week basically just not sleeping and burying my father, and like worried my daughter was gonna die, and and at my dad's funeral, which um, at his wake, which and. and the entire company came, and our company looked like the United Colors of Benetton. So you have to picture like the average audience member was a tweed blazer wearing primary care physician. That was my dad's scene. But in came the entire company, and so they, my assistant basically defied an order and said, we're telling everybody. So they all came, and then I was holding it together pretty decently, um, but then I noticed the retail frontline workers carpooled and came to my dad's way. And so I walk in, and I see them speaking to my mother and hugging my mom, and then, you know, I could hear them saying, oh, Mrs. Ree, like, you did a good job with your son. He's a good guy. <laughs> And my mom, who was always quizzical, saying, because I always say, these women are you. And my mom would say, what? <laughs> what do you mean? And I'm like, she's like, really? And I just said, yeah, mom. Like, here, there are you. And then she understood in that moment. I saw it. And then the women came to me, and one of them held my hand and said, um, James, like, you didn't tell anyone about anything? Tough guy, you don't need any help. You can't ask for help. And then I said, no, I just didn't want to be a burden. That's not my role here. <laughs> like, and then um, her name's Cherry. She held my hand and said, uh, you know, Mr. James, you didn't think we'd find out and be here for you? I just started crying. Like I just like, I, I just couldn't stop crying. And so the entire, you know, it's when I talk about past, present, future, my entire life was in that funeral home. Everyone was there. And I'm sobbing, like heaving. And um, 
that's the one and only time the women of Ashley Stewart met my mother. And they met that one time, and I'll never forget it. And I, that was it. You want to talk about surrender and sort of prioritizing what's important? They actually met your mother before then. They had? Yes. Where? You. Oh. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Yeah, it's, yeah, I come from a long line of very strong women. My grandmother lost her, my grandfather during the Korean War, never, he never came home. So my grandmother raised four kids during the Korean War alone and fled down to Pusan, that whole thing. She did that and then she couldn't read. Like Korean women at that, they, they were, most of them were not literate. So she raised four kids by herself and put all four through college. And so when my wife met her, that one time, my Meg was, she just said, oh my gosh, your grandmother is, it's like magical. She's just this. So I'm from a long line of this. And so they're both in me. Um, anyway, so that's, I don't know, but that's surrender. So that moment, armor off, upside down hedgehog. Like I just, like when you, when you, when you live like that, there's nothing, I'm like, what, what can you do to hurt me? There's nothing, there's nothing you can do. And I think the last thing I would love to just say is like the, the biggest gift I got. So people a lot of times talk about Ashley Stewart and they say, oh, you did so much for these women. And I still think I got, not that it's a competition, I got the better end of the deal. They really, I just rediscovered me. It's like supreme calmness about, yeah, I'm bad at this, suck at this, I have these annoying habits, you're right. That's it, like I'm doing the best I can. And that, I really had a lot of um, up until I would say 18 and then life puts you through the ringer. And so I got it back early and I, I would like for people to rediscover that in you and to give you permission to have that in you and then particularly for your children for them to sort of sort of see life sort of 70 years and 70 years and 350 pages right and that so that you don't have to tell them that because they won't listen to you but maybe if someone else says it they may they may listen a little bit more so James I'm told we have to move to the Q&A but we, we can't move there until I'm just a guy that likes to summarize things, so yeah. I just need to say this, that having uh, devoured this book, I think this book is about uh, two things in probably the most difficult way, uh, but the most beautiful way, uh, connectedness and love. And I want to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I'll, bring a, I'll bring a mic around. Um, how, did, how did you come to the company? Were you like a private equity guy that came in? Did you come with this intentionality? Did you find it there? Like how did you, how did you come to do this job? Yeah, so I am uh, in Boston. Most of my identity has been private equity guy, which I always put in quotes the private equity guy. And then it was in a um, portfolio company of a employer I had left. And so sometimes when that happens, you stay on as a board member or like advisor because they wanna have some continuity in the management of the investment. And that's the status of it. Um, and I had been a member of the deal team that helped save the company from the first bankruptcy and play the classic role of like there's a professional management team, I'm the private equity guy, you know, and like you hold them accountable once every quarter and you know, it's their job to run the company and it just wasn't run ideally the way it could have been, should have been, it, it's not a, it just didn't work and I felt accountable. I was like, you know, if I'd still been at the firm, maybe it would have been better. 
and I knew the jobs at stake. I had an inkling about what this company did for the community. I, I knew. That's why we made the investment. And they seem scared, actually. A lot of the frontline workers seem scared of the management teams, which is not uncommon, which is sad, right? So, and so I said, uh, um, we were just, you can, uh, private equity can be, it can be good, it can be pretty callous. Depends on the user. <laughs> um, it just bothered me. It's just like, oh, it's whatever. It's a portfolio company. Or, it, does that make sense? It's, it's, a, it's a job. We forget that, though. People who are in the money business, like, it's pretty easy to delete rows and subtract things on a spreadsheet. And so I felt accountable. I mean, that's it. And so I said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll do this for six months. I'll avert liquidation. I'm a very experienced, distressed guy. And I've operated companies before. It's just, again, it's about people not knowing that. I've done it. And then after six months, I wanted to come home. It was a six-month thing. I said, Meg, six months, I'm back. And a lot of things happened. There was a lot of self-awareness. I got very close with the women that were working in the stores. Um, I saw, I s the hurricane that comes when you're in distress in our system is not a good hurricane. And it's a long conversation. I'm happy to talk about like the distress business and what happens to people. <laughs> And regular people with restructuring professionals is not good. And so think about it. I basically was like the world that my parents sort of wanted me to be in, I was now facing that world down and saying, I'm not going to let you do that. Like, and they're like, James, come on. Come on. You're a private. Go back to Boston. I was like, I can't let you do that. It's wrong. Like, you have to give this company a, a shot to, to survive. Like, I'm not going to play that game. There's a lot of this stuff that happens. I mean, I'm looking at one of my friends who's in that bit. She knows. It's just that. And it was just that moment. I'm like, no. And to put, to put one more, a little bit of levity on this, it was like this. You know Naked Gun? This is, you know, when Le Leslie Nielsen at the end says, our life might not amount to much, but this is our... Uh, might not amount to a hill of beans, but this is our hill, and these are our beans. It was that moment. I was like, no, I'm sorry. And so after six months, sadly, the whole world said no, and I was stuck talking about agency. I was like, what am I going to do? I know I'm right. Do I just turn away? I can just go home, resume my identity. Everything is going to be easy, but I made a promise. And so I raised money, and I showed up at bankruptcy court, and we took the business out. And I said, I guess I'm staying. <laughs> like, and that's what happened. There's no purposeful hero. A lot of this in the book, you're gonna, it's like struggle. It's accidental struggle and like these, these twists and turns where friends, the random friend or my wife was not random, saying, no. The James I know sees things through. That's all I needed to hear. Like, I'm like, fine, well, we're doing it. But it was not, it was a lot of hand wringing, and it wasn't, there was no hero. It was, I felt ashamed a lot about how um, much I wanted to sort of look the other way, actually. But I didn't in the end. Thank, thank you, James. I, I mean, I could make a comment, but I'm not going to comment because I want someone else to ask a question. So, <laughs> is there another question? I'm just wondering, when was the first moment you knew you wanted to write either this book or a book? I thought about, I went into seclusion actually for about six months after my mom, after I left. Um, I just was out of sight for six, six, nine months, just grieving. I didn't realize how much I needed to do that because I lost both parents in four years. 
And we went through COVID. It's all this stuff. So I just basically just needed alone time. <laughs> spend time with my kids, you know, keep them safe, spend time with Meg. And then um, I thought about the, I wanted to sort of, my life got accidentally more public during this time period because I had to go out and advocate. I'm not, I've never done, I just got, I'm not a social media, like it's all the, I'm like, I don't like it. And then I, so I went back and then um, for about a few years I did just quiet teaching and then once, once I said yes to the TED talk, then I'm like, I probably will write a book because most people write a book and then do a TED talk. I do everything backwards. <laughs> It really is, it's like my life, but think about a helicopter, by the way, I like helicopter for this reason too. In Europe it spins this way, in America it spins this way. <laughs> it doesn't matter, it just has to balance. And I like that, I was like, live the life you wanna live. And, you know, it's, um, so after the TED talk, then I said maybe I'm gonna have to write a, I should write a book. Because if you read, listen to the TED talk, I try to squeeze 50, 360 pages and. 14 minutes and 58 seconds. It's like, it's a lot. So, and then I couldn't do it. I sort of publicly confessed on this Brene Brown Dare to Lead conversation. I'm like, I st stink at writing a book. I was like, I didn't think I could do it. And then um, a lot of her listeners kept emailing me. And it was like, write the book. It wasn't an, an ask. And so then I'm like, and then on the, literally on the three-year anniversary of my mother's passing, around that time, so in Korean culture, you, I didn't know this, you mourn your parents sort of for three years, like kind of ritualistically. It's uh, important. W around that time, I just started saying, I, I, I got it. And I heard that song in my head. I was composing music before writing the book. The, the, the the book is a piece of, it literally is a piece of music. When you read it, you'll hear that song and you'll hear the tempo change, the timbre change. It's literally written in E flat major. And um, that's when I, and it came out fast. That's. Kathy, do we have time for just one more quick question or one no? One more quick question. We just want to make sure that you have any time. Okay. Uh, one more quick question. Uh, Terry will ask a question. <laughs> so uh, it, this is really impressive in terms of what you've done for the uh, corporate world. And oftentimes having worked in the corporate world, the corporations are no more than dysfunctional families that we're trying to write. So my question to you is about your family because you've had a life, lot of life lessons in your own world. What gifts have you given to your family as a result of your learning? and being able to create this world for yourself. I wish they were still here so that they could um, <laughs> um, make faces at me. I, I, I think, and my, I have some very close friends here, um, I think our three children have a true appreciation of what agency means. They're their own little people. And as I write in the acknowledgments, they know that they have a lot of people who love them. A lot. They're all in the book. And we didn't have that. So when we, my parents would always say, it's just us five. It's true, we were the only ones here. And so, and they cut off, cut us off from our history because there was too much pain. They didn't want to talk about the Korean War. They didn't want to talk about the fact that my grandfather got shot or that my grandmother died young, my, my dad's. So they, they just didn't talk about it. And they, didn't wa they wanted us to like, you know, sing Bruce Springsteen. Seriously, like they were like, it's not good for you to dwell in the past. And so I think that this book, um, this is my red helicopter like to the world actually. But for my children, like, they will always have this. It was a Korean w word called chung, that connectedness. They will always have this book. And so I hope that they will pick it up when they feel sad. 
and they know that there's a lot of there are generations of people, of family and friends that love them. And a lot of them are sitting right here too. And so they're, they're very lucky. So. That's, that's the gift that I'm giving them. Thank you, thank you.